Hi, my name is Josh, and this is my channel, Controversial Catholic, where we talk about the church, the faith, as well as what's going on in the world today from a faith-based perspective. This, my first episode, is also the first part in a series of videos that I am making on the topic of what is perhaps the biggest disagreement between Catholics and Protestants, namely, on the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist, also known as Holy Communion. Now, as Catholics, we believe that when the priest blesses the bread and the wine and says, this is my body, this is my blood, which are the same words that Jesus used at the Last Supper, then by the power of the Holy Spirit, the substance of the bread and wine are changed into the substance of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Protestants do not believe this. Instead, what Protestants believe is that Holy Communion is merely a symbol of the body and blood of Christ. Or, if they do believe that Christ is present, they believe that he is present only spiritually and not bodily. So, who is correct? Well, to answer this, we're going to be looking through sacred scripture as well as at the writings of the early Christians. We'll also take a look at how the doctrine of the real presence developed throughout church history, and we are going to look at some of the Eucharistic miracles that have occurred throughout the ages, along with answering some common Protestant objections along the way. First, let's look at sacred scripture. In the New Testament, in the Holy Gospel according to St. John chapter 6, we read about how Jesus works a great sign by multiplying five loaves of bread and two fish and feeding over 5,000 people. Now the people, after witnessing this great miracle, started to run after Jesus. However, Jesus turns to these people and says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews argued among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now many of his disciples said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. And after Jesus said this, many of his disciples left him and no longer followed him. And then Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? And it was Simon Peter who answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? We know that you have the words of eternal life. Now when Jesus tells us that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood, he doesn't sound like he's talking figuratively. He sounds like he's being serious. And when the disciples leave him, he doesn't try to go after them and explain himself. He just lets them go, because they understood full well what he meant. 
But what about the part where Jesus says, It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Now many Protestants will point to that verse and say, Aha! There, see? Jesus says that it is the Spirit that gives life, and the flesh is of no avail, and the words that I have spoken are spirit and life. Therefore, when Jesus tells us that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood, he isn't speaking literally, he is only speaking spiritually. Well, here's the problem with that interpretation. Throughout the New Testament, the words spirit and flesh are used to refer to that which comes from God and is in accordance with his divine will, called spirit, and that which is opposed to God and is corrupted by sin, called flesh. For example, in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, St. Paul tells us, For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. And yet, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, the very same St. Paul tells his readers, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? So in one verse, St. Paul tells us that he knows that there is no good thing in his flesh. Then in another verse, St. Paul tells us that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. So, which is it? When St. Paul tells us that he knows that there is no good thing in his flesh, he's not talking about this right here. Instead, he's talking about everything in his bodily nature that has been corrupted by sin. In Catholic theology, we have a word for this. It is called concupiscence, which means disordered desires for natural goods, or inner temptations to commit sin. Because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, we all inherited from them an inner inclination towards sin. That is concupiscence. To give another example, in Galatians chapter 5, St. Paul tells us that the works of the flesh are plain, immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like, while the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So again, we see here that the word flesh is used to refer to everything that is against God, while the word spirit is used to refer to everything that comes from God. So when Jesus tells us that the words he has spoken are spirit and life, he's not denying a literal interpretation of what he just said. He's actually confirming it. It's like he's saying, Hey, fellas, you know how I said that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you? You know how I said that my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink? You know how I said that whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him? Those words are spirit and life. Those words are from God, from me. And unless you accept them, you cannot be my disciple. So if Jesus really is telling us to eat his flesh and drink his blood, then that begs the question, the same question that the Jews had at the very beginning. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, Jesus himself shows us how he will give us his flesh to eat at the Last Supper, where he institutes the Holy Eucharist. As we read in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessed, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
and he took a chalice, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you and my Father's kingdom. Now our Lord, when he blesses the bread and wine, he doesn't say, this represents my body, this represents my blood. He says, this is my body, this is my blood. We believe that when Jesus spoke these words, the substance of the bread and wine were changed into the substance of the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. And if you want even more scriptural evidence for this, you need look no further than the writings of St. Paul himself on the subject. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, St. Paul tells us, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the chalice, after supper, saying, This chalice is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now let me pause here for a moment. What St. Paul is talking about is how our Lord Jesus commanded the apostles at the Last Supper to celebrate the Eucharist. It is like Jesus was saying to his apostles, Watch what I'm doing here. You see how I take bread in my hands and bless it, saying, This is my body? You see how I take a cup of wine and bless it, saying, This is my blood? I want you to do this. I want you to take bread and bless it, saying, This is my body. I want you to take a cup of wine and bless it, saying, This is my blood. What you see me doing here, I command you to do. Now, when was the last time that you saw a Protestant minister bless bread and wine and say, this is my body, this is my blood? Probably never. Only Catholic priests and Orthodox priests actually do what Jesus himself commanded his apostles to do at the Last Supper. And St. Paul, as he tells us, also celebrated the Holy Eucharist because... St. Paul was a priest. Now some Protestants may say, Oh, but our Lord told us to do this in remembrance of him. Remembrance of him. So Holy Communion is just a memorial of the Passion of Christ. But Jesus doesn't say that the bread and wine are a memorial of his Passion. He says that the bread and wine are his body and blood. Now yes, we do remember what our Lord Jesus did for us when we receive him in Holy Communion. Absolutely. But the bread and the wine, they still become the real body and blood of Jesus. Now, back to St. Paul. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the chalice, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That, my friends, is sacrificial language. The death of the Lord is a sacrifice. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice to the Heavenly Father to redeem us from sin, and you cannot have the sacrifice of the Lord without his real body and blood. Not that Jesus is sacrificed over and over again. He's not. Jesus died once and for all, to save us from sin. Rather, it is the one eternal sacrifice of Christ that is made present for us. 
St. Paul continues, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. For anyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now, if Holy Communion was only a symbol of the body and blood of Christ, or if Christ was only spiritually present, then why would receiving the bread and wine unworthily, that is to say, in a state of mortal sin, make you guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord? Well, the only way it could make you guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord would be if the bread and wine truly become the body and blood of the Lord. There is just no way around it. In fact, the sin of receiving our Lord unworthily in the Blessed Sacrament is so great that you can get sick and even die from it. Yes, to receive the Holy Eucharist in a state of mortal sin, that's something you can even die from. The sacred scriptures make it very clear that the Holy Eucharist, that Holy Communion, really is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is how Jesus gives us his flesh to eat and his blood to drink. And where the body and blood of the Lord are, there also is his soul and his divinity. As Catholics, we have this great privilege of receiving the Lord Jesus into our very selves. Let us, therefore, give thanks for this wonderful blessing and go up to receive our Lord worthily and with great reverence and allow his sanctifying grace to change us so that, like St. Paul, we may also say, it is no longer I but Christ who lives within me. That's it for this episode. Next time, we'll be taking a look at the early Christians and what they wrote about the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that notifications bell so you don't miss an episode, as it would really help the channel out. God bless, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.